And now we bring you another episode of Edgar Rice Burroughs' amazing story, Tarzan of the Apes. Tarzan drops from a tree, dashes down the beach toward the fighting men. The knife flashes downward. Tracy closes his eyes. It's the end. Tarzan's flying feet sends silent sprays of sand shooting out behind him. Tango's arm, which is driving the knife downward into Tracy, is grasped by Tarzan, pulled back with a terrific jerk which almost pulls his arm out of its socket. The Chinaman is hurled from Tracy's body and sent sprawling backwards. Deets draws a knife and leaps upon Tarzan's unprotected back, but his shadow on the sand warns Tarzan. He whirls, catches the cockney's upraised hand in his, and with his free hand he grasps the cockney's throat. Tarzan's vice-like fingers close the, the man's windpipe. The cockney's eyes bulge. His face turns a ghastly blue. He sinks to his knees, limp. Tarzan releases his death grip, and Gates pitches forward in the sand, unconscious, all but dead. For a second, Tarzan looks at his fellow men. His lip curls contemptuously. He turns to the others. Fango snatches the green jade bottle and runs for the jungle. Tracy's after him. Tracy knows that to return the bottle to Yacht is the only way to save Jane, Clayton, and Professor Porter. The giant Chinaman is swifter by far than Tracy, who doggedly runs after him. The two men disappear in the rank undergrowth of the jungle. Tarzan, puzzled, watches, and then follows them, leaving the inert gates lying on the sand. Gaining the jungle, Tarzan leaps into a tree, swings off after the pair. His mind is in a quandary. The copper man and the wizened one are not trying to kill the tall man because they want to eat him. It's because of the green thing he had seen them pick up on the beach. They belonged to the same tribe. They came from the same boat. Yet two of them had tried to kill the other. It's all very strange, Tarzan thinks, as he speeds through the trees following the trail of the two men. He pauses for a second, standing poised on a branch, and looks down in the thick underbrush below, studying it for a moment. Evidently, the copper man, with eyes like Histus, had outdistanced the man whose face he liked. The tall man had gone off in one direction in pursuit. It would be better to follow the copper man, the man he did not like, for he had the green thing which he had taken away from the tall man. Tarzan leaps to another branch and is on his way with terrific silent speed of an arboreal ape on the hunt. He comes upon the Chinaman pushing his way through the jungle. He is no longer running, but walking, seemingly a little uncertain of his course. The man is lost. With a suddenness which makes the Chinaman step backward with a cry, Tarzan drops down in front of him. An expression of terror crosses the Oriental's face. But he's no coward. He stands his ground, waiting. The Chinaman is nearly as tall as Tarzan. He's a brute of a man, heavy-muscled, agile. The copper man appraises the bronze giant who stands, observing him so curiously. Slowly, hardly perceptibly, the Chinaman's hand creeps to the knife at his belt. Tarzan sees the movement, but is indifferent to it. By the time it'll take the copper man to draw the knife and come close enough to bring it into play, he'll be ready for him. Suddenly, Fango whips the knife from his belt, pulls it back over his head, hurls it with the full force of his tremendous arm. The knife tries startling in his shoulder. With a triumphant cry, Fango rushes the ape man. Meanwhile, aboard the tramp steamer in the harbor, we find that Jane Porter and her father, and William Clayton locked in the salon, waiting for Tracy to return the jade green bottle, which will save their lives. This waiting is driving me mad. I'll play you a game of Russian bank until Captain Tracy comes back, Mr. Clayton. You know, I have a hunch that Tracy isn't coming back. Uh, nonsense, Clayton. Of course he's coming back. He'll have no alternative. That pirate young sent two of his men ashore with him. At the same time, I... I wish I, I knew what had happened to... Philander, it wouldn't surprise me if he sent those men not to make sure that he would come back, but to make sure he wouldn't. I saw Yonk take the Chinaman aside and tell him something. By the nasty look in the beggar's face, I'd say that it didn't look any too well for the captain. As to Philander, he can't be any worse off than we are. Uh, you're right. Our own position is none too safe. In fact, it might almost be classed as hazardous. Oh, I hardly think Yonk would dare do away with us. If Captain Tracy finds the chart, we'll probably lose the treasure, if there is a treasure, and then be set ashore in some strange port to make our way back as best we can. Yont would dare anything. With any of us alive, he's in constant danger. However, if he can do away with us, disband the crew and scuttle the ship, he'd be comparatively safe. Naturally, the ship would be reported missing. 
And after a while, it would be thought one of the tragedies of the sea, where a ship goes down with all hands lost and is never heard of again. Well, you have the most charming imagination, Mr. Clayton. Oh, I don't wish to be alarming. But we might as well face this thing. We're in a beastly hole. On the other hand, Clayton, uh, there's no use congesting our livers by getting into a frenzy about it. No, 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 no. There's nothing we can do but wait. So let's wait with the minimum of effort. If there were only some way we could barricade ourselves and at least hold them off for a bit. By Joe! What? As long as the ship is at anchor, no one is likely to go near the steering wheel. Well, and it's on the deck below this. A filthy hole, but it has a watertight compartment door. It's the last place they would look for us in, and even if they did find us, they'd have the dickens' own time getting into us. Well, the only trouble with your idea, Mr. Clayton, seems to lie in getting there. And that I don't think is so very difficult. I've been watching our guard. He's a big Negro, a mute. And being a mute, he can't raise an outcry. Uh, but this door is locked. We can't... One to... good jar would burst it open. We'll both throw our weight against it. Once outside, you and Jane make for the steering gear. I'll take care of the Negro. All right. Let's try it. Right. Both together. Now! Oh. Run now! I'll get the guard! The sound of the door being burst open carries faintly to the captain's cabin, where Yant is sitting with his right-hand man, Snipes. What was that? I didn't hear nothing, Chief. I thought I heard something. Anyway, I'm going to take every man ashore. And I'm going to find Tracy in that double-crossing cheek and lie me if I have to crawl across Africa on my hands and knees. <laughs> Maybe they're still looking for the green bottle on the beach. Don't be a fool. They found the bottle, and the three of them have gone after the treasure. Tracy's got a smooth tongue. He talked them into running out on me. But I'll find them. And when I do, it'll be very artistic, Snipes. All hands on deck and ship them all over the side. Shall I leave the dumb nigger to stand watch over the passengers? No. Ain't they liable to get away? No. You... You ain't going to... Yes. We've got to get rid of them sometime. Give me that automatic. And get these men in the boats while I cancel our passengers' round trip tickets. Right, Al. I'll send one of the boats back after you as soon as. This way, Porter. What was that? Hey! Look out the port here! What? The guys have busted out of the town. Well, let me see. A fine guard you put over them. Shall I put them, Chief? No. They're going below. Let's see what their game is. Right, Joe. Come, Come on. Now we return to Tarzan. He tries to lift his arm. There's a shooting pain in his shoulder. If he moves his arm, he'll cut a muscle. The arm is useless until he removes the knife. Fango is upon him, confident that his strength will equal that of Tarzan now that one arm is crippled. Fango snatches up a dead branch, swinging the club around his head, bears down upon Tarzan. Tarzan stands motionless, waiting. Fango wheels the club high, brings it down with tremendous force. With a speed greater than any boxer, Tarzan sidesteps. The club barely misses him. Tarzan's good arm shoots out, catches the Chinaman around the waist. With a mighty jerk, sends Fango spinning, the club flying from his hand. Before he falls, Tarzan is upon him. Running low like a football player, Tarzan strikes Fango with his good head just above the knees. Chinaman falls over Tarzan's back. At the same time, Tarzan stands up, grabbing the Chinaman's foot. Fango hangs over Tarzan's shoulder like a sack of meal, holding the Chinaman's ankle in an iron grasp. Tarzan starts to revolve. Faster, faster. Fango swings out wide in an arc. Tarzan, with superhuman strength, clings to his ankle as he turns faster, faster. Tarzan is swinging Fango around with him. And as an athlete to swing a hammer, leaning back farther and farther, turning faster and faster. Suddenly, Tarzan lets go. Fango flies through the air with a flash of color. Fango fumbles at the base of the tree, stung. He struggles to his feet, wavers. There's fear in his eyes. Fear for this man whose strength is that of the great apes. Tarzan is upon him before he can run. Fango picks up a huge rock, raises it high over his head with both hands and hurls it at Tarzan. The rock flies directly at Tarzan's head. Tarzan ducks. It misses him by a fraction of an inch. On Tarzan comes. Fango turns to run. It's too late. The ape man's charging body strikes him, drives him against a small tree. Tarzan's good arm wraps about the Chinaman in the tree. The great muscles in his arm tense. Slowly, as he crushes the murderous writhing Fango against the tree. The great muscles in Tarzan's neck, shoulder, and arm knock and swell as he exerts his terrific strength. Tarzan releases his hold. 
The Chinaman slumps to the ground. Tarzan gives no further attention to the dead man. Slowly, carefully, he removes the knife sticking from his shoulder. The pain makes his jaw muscles bulge. The knife comes out easily, and to his surprise, he can now move his arm. The wound is minor but painful. Tarzan selects leaves from a nearby shrub and with them treats the open wound. He turns his attention to the dead Chinaman, searches him until he finds the green bottle, and starts with never a backward glance at his victim to seek the tall man to whom the bottle belongs. Swinging with easy grace and miraculous speed, Tarzan comes upon Captain Tracy, hopelessly lost in the maze of undergrowth. A slight movement in the tall grass behind Tracy catches Tarzan's eye. A tawny shadow. Numa the lion crouched for a swing. 